this first video is really just a very basic introduction to economics and some of the very first topics that come up in the A-level course. This is probably a slightly simplistic way of thinking about what scientists do, but I would suggest if you wanted to prove a scientific theory, then you would start with a hypothesis, so kind of a proposition that you believe to be true. And you'd use that to develop predictions about what's going to happen when you change certain variables. And then based on that, you'd use evidence to test these predictions. And looking at your evidence, you could use that to form a theory or possibly keep testing and keep testing or amend or reject your hypothesis based on the evidence that you found. So what's all of this got to do with economics? Well, economics is what we call a social science, and that makes it different to a natural science because it's it's softer than natural sciences. And that means that theories made in economics can survive a lot more exceptions. And that's because they're based on individual behavior and the relationships between people. And so those theories kind of have to be softer, otherwise you wouldn't really be able to make any. So one example of this would be in classical economics, we make the assumption that consumers always act rationally. And you've only got to look at consumers and people when they smoke cigarettes or when they drink too much to see that that just isn't the case. But this kind of central theory has remained because it's our best guess at how people are going to act in most situations. So in economics, we make a distinction between two different types of statements that we might make, because some statements that we make are testable against evidence and facts, and some statements are based on opinions. And so the first of those two we call positive statements. So they're based on facts and they can be tested. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be correct, but you can test them against evidence to see if they are. The other kind of statements we might make in economics are what we call normative statements, and they're based on value judgments. So these are subjective statements of opinions based on kind of what might ought to be. So let's have a look at a few examples. So reducing the price of alcohol encourages people to drink more. This would be an example of a positive statement because we could look at the data in terms of alcohol consumption and compare it to alcohol prices and test that against evidence. Minimum wage should be at least £10 an hour. This would be a normative statement because some people would agree with that and think that that's true. Some people would think that it should be higher than that. Some people would think that it should be lower than that. Cutting interest rates increases house prices would be a positive statement because again, we can look at the data on house prices, compare that to the data on interest rates and test that to see whether that assumption holds true. And climate change is the most serious economic problem. Now, sometimes there's a bit of a misconception with normative statements. They always include the word should. Well, this is an example of where that's not the case because this is a normative statement because who's to say what the most serious economic problem is? I think many people would agree that climate change is the most serious economic problem, but not absolutely everyone would. And there's no real way to test that um, against evidence. So that would be a normative statement. So coming around to some of the most basic definitions in, e in economics, um, the study of economics is all about how to best allocate our scarce resources. So it's all about scarcity and resource allocation. And the economic problem is all about the fact that resources that we have available to us are finite, but our wants are infinite. And how, therefore, are we going to solve that problem of scarcity um, and how are we going to allocate our resources among all those infinite wants? When we're making those decisions, we look at what we call kind of the three economic questions. So the first of those is what to produce. So what specific products or services should we be channeling our resources into production? Should we, should we be making more computers, bikes, cars, whatever it is? The second question would be how to produce. So what is the most efficient way to kind of organize that production? Should government take a greater role or should they leave it up to the private sector, for example? And then finally, we'd look at for whom to produce. So who is most deserving of those goods and services? Should it be people who have most money, have more access to goods and services, or should we try and live in a more equal society, for example? And when we're solving that economic problem, we do it using what we call the four main factors of production. And pretty much anything that we use within the production process could be broken down into one of these four different factors. 
So land is anything that is naturally occurring used in the production process. That is not just the land that we um, position our production on, but it's anything that we get out of that land. So cows used to make beef or oil used for fuel would all be examples of land. Labour is any human resources used in the production process. So that one's relatively self-explanatory. It's our staff, our doctors, our nurses, our teachers, and so on. Capital is any man-made aid to production. So anything that is made by um, humans to be used in the production process. So machines, production line equipment would all be examples of capital. And then enterprise really is the final one which brings the other three together. So that's kind of the creative spark that's needed to combine land, labour and capital. So really business owners provide the enterprise to combine those factors of production and produce output.